All right, guys, we don't have a ton of time in here, so we're just going to get rolling. Are we good, Jaron? Okay. So starting off, well, I'm Nate Edwards. This is our, from BYU. This is our student, Donovan. And we'll keep this kind of casual. We'll, like, if you guys have questions, feel free to raise your hand. We did make room at the end to answer questions, so if we don't cover it during the presentation, uh, go ahead and ask your questions then as well, or if it's relevant while we're going on, just raise your hand. Again, we'll just keep it casual. Um, starting off, I just want you guys to know I'm not like the expert in drones, but I have been flying for a few years, and we'll have uh, Donovan kind of share his experience who recently just passed his test, but let's, uh, let's get going. So the first thing we wanted to talk about is why. So why flying drones? Why is it important? Why does it add value? So a couple bullet points that we came up with, and this is not an exclusive list, but one, and you guys know all this, right? Drones offer a unique perspective. So you guys know the 510 rule, right? When we're taking photos, we're probably average 510 height, you know, give or take a little bit. So those photos, people see that every single day. So if you can change that perspective, it just adds something unique. So with your drone, right, you're getting much, much higher. Expanded skill set. You can get great stock photos of campus for people to use. This is important too. It gives added value to you as an employee, as a photographer. Added value to your position. It's a lot cheaper than getting a helicopter. Indeed. And you don't have to rely on other people. You don't have to worry about, well, there's a drone guy on campus or a drone girl on campus and they only have so much availability or we have to go hire somebody to come to drone. You can go anytime. You can fly anytime. And it's nice, a lot of drones now, well, even you know, back a while ago, they're so compact. So when you go and travel, it takes up the space of one of your lenses. Right, it's super nice to take when you're traveling, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, flying drones is a blast, and it's like a really cool extended selfie stick. Right, <laughs> so you can use it for that. Here's just a couple shots um, that either myself or Donovan have taken, just to kind of give an idea. And you guys have seen, I'm sure, tons of drone photos, but just to give an idea of what it can do for your campus, for surrounding areas and like when you travel. Here, and there's more there than I thought, but anyway. So here's a question, and I'm gonna have Donovan cover this, what drones to get. Like we're just, and we're just covering the basics. Like there are a lot of options out there. There's a ton of options, but we, had, we broke it up into different segments of cost and here's a couple ideas within those different budgets that you may have. Yeah, so our first little range is 500 to $1,000. So if you have minimal budget, you want something nice and easy, um, this is one of the recommendations we have. This is actually the drone I personally own and use and fly with. Um, I really like it. It's the Mini 3 Pro. Uh, it just came out about a year ago. Uh, currently, right now, it's $909 with the RC remote. It's a little bit cheaper, but I like having this remote because then you don't have to worry about plugging your phone into the remote and worry about you losing connection or someone calls you in the middle of a flight and then you panic like I do. Um, just a couple notable features. It's a 48 megapixel camera. Uh, it shoots 4K video. Um, it has an f1.7 aperture, so it's really good in low light conditions. Uh, it's less than 0.55 pounds, uh, which is underneath the need to register your drone with the FAA. Uh, so that's why I got it to start because I didn't really want to register, but then I learned it was really easy So we'll go over that later and then another big feature on this drone is that it has true vertical shooting So it's one of the only drones on the market where you hit a button on your remote and the sensor actually goes from horizontal to vertical So if you need stuff for Instagram, right? You're shooting reels Maybe some TikToks or some more social media style content for your university This is a really solid option at that price range um, and it's really good for photos. So if, you, if your focus is more photo with some good video capabilities, this is a solid option. I will say too, while Donovan keeps going, um, just keep in mind if you're wondering about which drone to get, the smaller and lighter the drone, 
the harder it is to fly in wind. Yeah. So if you have windy conditions, a small drone's just gonna get... It gets tossed. Yeah, it'll get blown away. So just keep those things in mind. If it's, if it's a light breeze or a calm day, no problems at all. Yeah. So also within this uh, $500 to $1,000 category, we have the DJI Air 2S. Um, this is another drone that some other people in our office have bought, uh, just personally. Uh, this is about $1,000. It was just recently on sale. I don't know if the sale is still going. Uh, but it's just a bit over a pound, so it's not super heavy. It folds up, and it's really compact as well. Uh, it's a 20 megapixel sensor, but it has more video recording capability, so you can shoot 5.4K. And I think you get more frame rate options, so 60 frames a second, 24 frames a second, uh, 30 frames a second. And it's at a constant f2.8 aperture. So if you're more video focused, this could be a really good drone for you too. Um, I've seen the footage from this drone. It's really, really solid. Um, and it's just a nice drone for the price point. And for most of these two with your camera settings, so this one's f2.8, mm -hmm. what was the other one? 1.7. 1.7. So those are fixed apertures. Yeah, you can't right? change them. So th you just are changing your shutter speed, ISO, and, and so forth. So and neutral density. What's that? Yeah, and neutral density filters. If yep. you have some of those yep. and you're flying during the day, that helps with yeah, the exposure. Yeah, so a lot of these have ND filters and different kits that you can put on them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great point. So our next range is $1,000 to $3,000. Um, if you're looking for something a little bit different in the drone world right now, uh, you can always go with an FPV drone. Um, if you've seen any of the footage from these, you know it can get kind of crazy kind of quick, but it's really unique in what it can capture. So this is the uh, DJI Avada, Avada? I don't know how you say that. I, can't, I forget it every time. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not that knowledgeable in the drone industry, I guess. But yeah, I've heard it called like many different things. Yeah, but. yeah. so this is their uh, Explorer combo. It's $1,200. This gets you the drone, a uh, battery, I believe an SD card, and then the FPV goggles and the remote so that you can actually steer your drone. So, so yeah, this remote's a little bit different. The motion controller, it's like a joystick, mm -hmm. and that's like it has, that's how you control it, right? It has a trigger. It makes you go forward, and if you want to turn left, you go left. If you want to go right, you go right. If you're getting into the FPV world and you don't want to really dive into using the manual controls, this is a really easy, intuitive way to do it. It does limit you on FPV like mm -hmm. capabilities and its maneuverability, but it's still way fun, super easy to fly. Yeah, Nate's been playing with that drone a little bit more lately, and we've had a lot of fun with it, but we're not experts in the FPV drone field either. So um, the only other thing that this drone does that's way more unique than the other drones is it has a 155 degree field of view. So it's super wide on what it can capture. Um, if you want something like that, that can make some really fun kind of motion throughout your campus or um, whatever video you're trying to make, this is a good option um, in that category. And then next we've got the DJI Mavic 3 Pro. This is something I believe our BYU video team has. Uh, this is the drone that they have and that we use occasionally. Um, it's $21.99, so it's a little bit more on the pricier side. This is where you get into the really expensive kind of field of drones. Uh, it's got a Hasselblad uh, sensor, and it's got three different cameras on it. So uh, within the field, you get, a, you get like a wide, and you can change the lens to more of kind of a middle range, maybe 50 mil, and you can get into more telephoto as well. So you can have a couple lens options there, all built into the camera. Uh, it can record 5.1K. Uh, this one does have a variable aperture. I think it goes all the way down to 2.8. And if you need to change it to 5.6 or 8 or 11, I think it goes all the way up to there. Uh, and then this one is one of the heavier drones at about just over two pounds. So now we're gonna get into the field of you have stupid money to spend and you burn. Uh, that's the category we're going into now. This is 3,000 plus. Um, if you're a Sony shooter with a mirrorless camera, you can get this Air Peak S1 for nine grand. Um, and this actually attaches your full frame camera and lens to the drone. Um, so it's five pounds, 9.4 ounces without the camera. Uh, and then you add the camera on there and I think the max payload on it is 15 pounds. Uh, so the specs on that are just whatever specs of your Sony camera. And then if that's still too dull for your blood, you got this DJI Inspire 3 coming in at $16,500. Um, oh, and this doesn't come with a lens, that's just the camera and the drone. So uh, it shoots 8K, it's got 14 stops of dynamic range. Um, it can pan 360 degrees around the, camera, uh, around the drone. 
Um, and then, like I said, lenses aren't included. If you want those that are like, what, an extra two grand a piece? Yeah, Something they're, they're like pretty that. much the same as like your normal lenses that you're yeah. buying for your camera. Yeah, so if you have lots of money to spend and your university trusts you with everything in the world, I would recommend getting that. But if you don't, then some of the other options may be better Here's for you. Here's some things to consider too. So there are, and there's, again, there's a lot of other drone there's options out there. There's some that have been out there for a while. These are the, the newer models that have come out and you can get them for, you know, relatively cheap. The one thing to, to consider and maybe it's just because I'm, I'm kind of a snob when it comes to photos and the quality of images. They're not going to be the same if you're shooting like with your Canon R5 or any, like it's not going to be the same. So don't mm -hmm. expect the image quality to be like your full frame, frame centered camera. Unless you're probably going with like the Inspire 3 or you're throwing <laughs> up your Sony up there. then. Just go in with those expectations. Your image quality is not going to be as dynamic and as great. And if you're editing in camera raw, I really like to push the limits of my images. Like these will fall apart a little bit, but if you're using them for social media, you're not gonna notice a difference. Yeah. Like if that's your main primary use, you're not gonna see a difference. Like it's not gonna matter. Yeah, I haven't noticed a difference for anything that I've used. Um, the nice thing about most of the drones on here is that they do shoot a raw format. So you're not messing with JPEGs, so they're not falling apart, you know, upping your exposure half a stop. Um, so that's nice. But yeah, if you try to crop in more than halfway on this thing, you'll, you'll see the, the difference in quality, so. Do you have any, uh, any post-processing tips for, you know, do you up res anything after or do anything special to the I have. So um, I've taken some of the drone photos from the Mini 3 Pro because that's what I shoot on. Um, and I did a project for my school and the photo program this last semester. And the nice thing is that if you load it into Camera Raw, uh, Photoshop does have the enhance feature. So you can up the resolution by like, I think it's two times at least right now. And they're working on upgrading or upscaling it more. Um, that definitely helps save quality. If you're trying to crop tighter in on things, that definitely helps. Yeah, so. and especially with all the AI stuff that's coming out right mm -hmm. now too, to be able to take a low resolution file and make it any size and have AI fill in the gaps, like that's something to definitely consider. You it, know, that's, it that's that'll, that'll be coming very soon. Yeah, it looks good. I've taken drone prints from some of these drones and blown them up to over 16 by 20 and they've looked perfectly fine, so. We had an event a couple of weeks ago and I mean, they, they projected one over the entire length of the ballroom that was this wow. beautiful aerial picture from our uh, Inspired. Oh, yeah. nice, awesome. Yeah, the, drone, the drones, they do pretty good work now. If you get older ones, it, it's rough, it's but. The oh, the, like the Mavic 3? Yeah. Yeah, great. Awesome. And here's the other thing. I'm sure there's some of you, if not all of you, who have some drone experience or a lot of drone experience. If you guys have any comments in addition to what we're saying and more experience, mm -hmm. like, hey, that's what we're here for. Like, we don't claim to know everything about no. it. So if you guys have some additional insight, like, please uh, share it with the group. Yeah. So in case you can't use DJI products due to local government restrictions or Is just your Is there school, anybody who can't? I know there's some states. I just heard something about Texas not letting them. It's Texas, Florida, Florida. There's a bill in the Senate right now banning DJI drones nationwide. Oh, I thought that People. I didn't know about. China. Because they're worried about China. China. Yeah, it's a China. But DJI has no, like, they are a Chinese company, but they're not, like, they're, the U.S. is based in the U.S. Like their divisions are based in the like EU globally. So like there is probably some, but not enough. There's a big conspiracy going. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, if, really what it is. if the government really wants my sweet drone shots, they can have them. I mean, yeah. I don't, you have my little photo of the mountains. Go ahead. I don't care. But, but anyway, in, in case you are at a university where there are restrictions on mm -hmm. what brand of drone you can buy, like if you're not able to get DJI, here's a couple of options. I've never used them. Yeah, I haven't so either. This is just strictly based on research online and different options. So if you fall in that category, here's some options to look through uh, for drones that are not DJI. Yeah, so we'll leave that up there in case anybody wants a photo of that real quick. But now uh, we're gonna go more into the part 107 certification. This is a really crucial part of the uh, drone process, being able to fly on a campus. And Nate's going to go through kind of what that's like. Are, are there any Part 107 certified 
pilots in here. So we got nice. one, two. All right. So I'm going to ask you guys a question. How was it? How was taking your test? I, I was studying on an online video course for uh, DJ Pilot Pro or something like uh -huh. that. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the end of the video, they had practice tests. They said, get, try to get like a 90 or above. That way you'd be confident going to the real test. So I did it. I got a 80s, 90s. Went to the real test, sweat bullets. Get in there. I'm out of there in 30 minutes. I got a 92. Awesome. Like, it was so easy compared to this, but I can't say it'll be easy yeah. down the road. But yeah, awesome. I was like, oh, thank God. Yeah. Awesome. So, so doing one of the online courses helped you? Really. really yeah. Awesome. Cool. What, what was your experience? It was a pain. It was a pain? What, what was your process? I did, yeah. I did the online stuff. Yeah. But it's mm -hmm. very interesting. I mean, I, I really like the idea of the zones that we have across this country. And you need to know where you're at and when you're there. And, yeah. And to get permission if you need it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But with, I just got the Mini 3 Pro. Mm -hmm. And with the, the little battery, you're under the weight. And with the big battery, you're over the weight, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. But I got the certificate either way. Yep. Great. So, cool. yeah, for, for those who are not sure what this even means, so part 107, what does it mean? So it's essentially if you want to fly a drone for commercial purposes or to make money or for a business, whatever it is, you have to have this certification through the FAA. It says it also refers specifically to the certification drone pilots must have before they can legally offer professional drone services, which is exactly what I was just saying. So yeah. I'm repeating myself and I'm being redundant. So. <laughs> That's what I get for reading my notes on top of trying to ad lib there. <laughs> anyway, so it's essentially in every situation, if we're flying for our university, we've got to have this. If you're flying to make money, you've got to have this. Unless you're doing anything other than recreation for yourself, you need to have Part 107 certification. Now, how do you prepare? It was mentioned just a little bit. So this is one that myself and Donovan did, Drone Pilot Ground School. So it starts at about $300. It's a lifelong course. I'm not here to like necessarily promote them per se. I'm just letting you guys know that's the course that we use, and it was awesome. And I, mean, I will, sorry, to add on to that, just right now, I checked online last night. It's on sale. So if you're interested in taking this specific one, it's not $300 right now, it's $200. They have a summer sale, I think, going to the end of June. So that'll kind of knock it down on par with some of the other courses we have on this list. So you have some options there if you're wanting to take this specific one, but you don't want to fork over $300. And the nice thing is with a lot of these courses too is it's lifelong, mm -hmm. right? So once you pay for it, register, it's a resource that you can always go back to and refer to. Um, so another one, Drone Launch Academy. Again, these are not ones that I've done, but just kind of researching online and looking through. And there's a lot. There's a lot of these, and some of them are a lot cheaper. Some of them are like $50. But I think, my, I would assume, you get what you pay for. And just reading through some of the descriptions, it doesn't seem like they're as thorough. Um, and we'll have Donovan kind of talk about his experience in just a little bit. So Pilot Institute, and again, there's, there's a ton more that are online that are super, super helpful uh, in, in helping you prep for your test. So this is not paying for the test. This is third party groups who are offering you guidance and advice. If you were to just go, go try to do this on your own and yeah, read a big old book, like this would be a nightmare. Yeah. Um, so I, if you're thinking about doing your certification, 100% strongly recommend using one of these online courses to kind of direct you and guide you on what you need to know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So this is um, slightly off topic, but in terms of the 107, part 107 certification, if you're flying commercially or you're flying for the university, does that apply to students who might be flying like a mini drone and they aren't certified and they don't have insurance? How does it work at BYU? students flying drones on campus? So, so great question. So right now there's quote unquote a no drone policy. One, because we sit within Provo Airport's airspace. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, it doesn't matter if, 
it's me or somebody else, everybody has to go through risk management to fly on campus at our school. And so they're the filtering system and they're the ones that determine yes or no. And so if it's for just a hobbyist, odds are, no, you can't fly. And if it's somebody who's coming on campus and wants to film, well, risk management is the one that's going to say, yeah, that's a good enough reason, or no, you're not allowed to fly here, or, you know, for whatever purpose it is. So if somebody is actually flying a drone who hasn't gone through risk management, do they actually enforce it? Do they, are they looking um, and then intercepting, or? Yeah, great question. There's been many times on campus that I'm flying a drone, and some random person will walk up to me and be like, hey, there's no drone, you can't fly drones here. And so I'll have to explain, like, actually, yes, so yes, I are. can. But yeah, So I think they're just, I think people know that there's a no drone policy. And so mm -hmm. whether it's a professor or an administrator or something, I think they just randomly walk up to me and say, you're not allowed to, and then I'll just have to explain, like, actually, it's, it's okay. But thanks for checking, because it's, it's good that they are. Mm -hmm. Um, be especially because we also have a hospital right by the school with a helipad. Mm -hmm. And so there are certain areas of campus that you can't fly without getting a waiver through the FAA to fly in those spaces. So, okay, yeah. yeah, great question. Okay. So Donovan just passed his test. I did. And what did, you, what did you get? A 90? I got a 93. Three? Same thing, in and out in half hour, sweated bullets the whole time. Uh, but it was easier than I expected it to be, at least after taking the course. So, so he, it's fresh on his mind. He just passed last week, so yes. I asked him just to kind of share his experience. So you guys can kind of, like, it's, it's not as intimidating as it seems. It isn't, no. So uh, to give you an idea of the process, I did the drone pilot ground school like Nate did. He's the one that referred me over to that one. So that's the course I did. I started on it really hardcore on June 1st. And then I passed my drone exam on June 14th. So this isn't a process that's like, oh my goodness, I got to commit like six months of my life and sell my soul to get a drone license. Now you can do this pretty easily uh, if you just sit down and kind of take the time. The, the way that I liked the drone pilot school structure is that it's got just little segmented videos. So they're like five, maybe 10 minute little bite sized pieces. So it's really easy to sit down and even if you just need to do like an hour of it, you can get through a couple of different pieces, take some notes, and then they've got quizzes that you can take to kind of refresh your memory on the stuff that you've been learning. So I did that over the last uh, two weeks. Um, the test wasn't super bad because the course had those practice exams like you mentioned earlier. Yeah, yeah, and the practice exams were super, very, like super close to what the actual FAA exam looked like. So I felt very prepared going into it. Um, it I think they gave me two and a half hours to take that exam at the I took it at the Provo Airport because that's one of the air place, uh, one of the places that was authorized to give me the exam, and I did it in like 30 minutes. Some of the, some of the questions on there are like, "Hey, can you fly in this airspace?" And it's like, "No, because there's a helicopter right there. No, because there's this thing." It's like, "Yes, if you get authorization." So some of the questions are kind of easy. Some of them are going to require you to look at maps and charts and and read things and understand the different symbols and the airspaces. But the course the courses do a good job of kind of helping you understand that. And the drone book itself actually has a legend in there too, so you can always refer to that. Um, how and, it, and it is an open book test. It is an open book test. They give you, they give you the book. They no, give you no a, when we say open book test, it doesn't mean you can go Google answers. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, they'll give you like an aeronautical pilot's like book with like sectional charts and legends and like graph data and stuff. So it is a good resource to use. Like there's some yeah. stuff that's it's good. You, to you have to use it to pass some questions. Yeah, like they'll use it to help you refer to like, hey, if you're flying at this airport, what, what airspace is this airport in? Can you fly? And you have to classify, oh, that's class B airspace. Or no, I can fly there because there's nothing around it or stuff like that. So I saw a hand. Did anybody have a question? Go ahead. If you're over 40, <laughs> they do, they That's do, true. they get really, really busy. Uh, I agree with that. There are parts of it where you have to search. Like they'll give you like, hey, look at this spot on the map and there's like, just looks like a little kid took a crayon and just started coloring in the whole thing and there's just information everywhere. So that is a, that is a good resource to have in there. Two, $300 depending on whatever one you buy. The actually pay to take the exam itself is 175 
So uh, there are two separate costs if you sign up for the class and then you sign up for the exam. Um, and that's just a one time take exam. So if you, don't, if you go in and you don't pass it and you decide to take it again, you'll have to give over another $175. But a lot of these online courses, they guarantee you passing after doing the yeah. course or you're, they'll give you your money back or they'll pay for your next round, yeah. your next test or whatever. Yeah. Good. I was gonna say, I'm in drone pilot school now. And one of the things that was, I think they'll pay for your test or something like that. Or yeah, so, like something like that, you, they'll if, pay if for you, the test. I think if, if you, you fail, fail on that first okay. time, they'll but cover the cost of your test. Like when I went to get approval, we don't have a part 107 pilot on campus at the mm -hmm. moment. We have a drone and we've just been playing fast and loose. Uh, <laughs> we don't, I don't fly because of that, but um, like that was one of the things, like, oh, I failed, it'll pay. Yeah. We're like, oh, that price isn't that bad. It helped me with that aspect of getting approved. Yeah, so it's kind of, it's kind of a, you know, a safety net. So if you're worried about putting out that money for the test and, and the program, just know that if by chance you do fail, which if you go through the test and you take all the, or the program, you take all the practice tests, you, you've got to try pretty hard to not pass. Yeah. I, to, give, yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, to pass the actual exam, you have to get 70%. So the bar isn't super high in terms of like, you got to get a 95 or you'll never fly a drone. Like now you just got to get just a 70%, just a solid C, and you're good. So you can get 71 and pass, or you can get like 95 and pass. So yeah, and it's, you it's gotta you got to get 42 of them right on a 60 question exam. So um, your drone license, once you get it, um, I just went through this. After you pass the exam, you don't just have your license. You can't just go out and fly that day. You actually have to apply then for your drone license and like report your score. And when you pass the exam, uh, whatever airport or whatever facility you take it at, they'll give you a piece of paper that says, hey, here's, their, here's your list of steps to do to apply for uh, your drone certificate and your license. Um, and then they'll give you a temporary one um, and as you wait for your real one to kind of come in the mail in the next six to eight weeks. So I got my temporary license yesterday, actually, before we hopped on the plane. So You haven't gotten anything yet? I've had it for about three months. Oh, wow. Okay. So well, hopefully they send. Hopefully they send you one. <laughs> so um, your license lasts two years, uh, which is different than your drone registration, and that lasts three years. I don't know why they just don't make everything like two years, three years. They got complicated, I guess. Um, and then to renew it, uh, Nate has to go through this process pretty soon, I believe. And you just go online so and fill out another. So it course. used to be you had to go back and take the test all over again which I didn't realize that. And so I went back onto the drone pilot ground school to review, cause there's like a review for the test, like your mm -hmm. recurring test. And then I went through it and it's like, oh, just do the whole thing again, the whole program. And I'm like, wait, what? I'm like, isn't this like a condensed test you have to take? Anyway, so I had to take the whole test over again. But the nice thing is now they've changed it. So basically you go online, you watch a video, you answer a couple questions every two years just to kind of refresh through the FAA, which is so much nicer. And uh, so here's, here's what your drone license looks like. Um, and uh, just keep it on you. You may be asked to show it if somebody stops you. Mm -hmm. um, this is me on my very first flight as a licensed Part 107 drone pilot. This is our freshman Y, you know, where they get up. This is one from a, a year after, I think. So like, hey, let's, let's add a new aspect to this because normally we're just on the other side of the stadium taking a photo. And so we did some photo and video and it was, you know, it was a lot of fun. And then the next year I was doing the same thing. And, uh, and so my job is done, but then we have our, one of the performing groups up there. And I'm like, oh, that'll be just a really cool shot to pan across. I'll just fly down low, get them while they're performing. And uh, I'm zooming across, and I'm like, oh, I'm getting pretty close to the edge right there. And I look over, <laughs> and right when I look up, it like slams the concrete portal. And I'm like, oh, man. And the part, I mean, I'm super embarrassed, right? I'm like, I hope nobody saw that. And I'm kind of like trying to slowly put the remote away so nobody <laughs> sees that it was me that was doing it. And I walk over there, and there's the drone. 
So Ouch. propellers gone, batteries out, the gimbal's <laughs> all messed up. So hey, accidents happen. And thankfully, this wasn't a person, right? Because that would have really, uh, really hurt. Um, so I and they have stuff to like bounce back when it starts coming through. So the there are sensors on drones that kind of detect, you know, your surroundings. I have no idea why this one did not. Okay. Yeah. It, it, so it, that's another point, I guess, going back to which drone should you buy. You should know that not all drones have the same number of sensors. Some of them will only have a sensor on the bottom so that if you are flying towards a tree, a person, or a concrete wall, it will not stop unless you are paying attention. Other drones will have sensors that are down front and back so that if you are getting close to something uh, and you haven't turned off the automatic sensor, it will kind of stop and hover and it will kind of refuse to go forward. Um, yeah. my, the Mini 3 Pro has forward sensors, so I have noticed it stop, um, but you can turn the sensors off. That's another thing I, we should mention. You can turn them off, so you can crash into stuff if you're not Or careful. if you're in sport mode, some of them have sport mode where they just mm -hmm. go faster and your sensors do not work. I mean, it, and it tells you, right? You turn that off, your sensors aren't gonna work. Yeah. So anyway, the nice thing about DJI is they have a carry fresh program, right? So within X amount of years after you're buying your drone, if you purchase that, they will give you a complete replacement like twice within that time. So that's another thing to consider. All right, so I think it's different on different campuses who is in charge of drones and drone approvals. So on our campus, it's risk management. I remember when we went to Coastal Carolina and I was wanting to fly there. I contacted their risk management, but they actually sent me to a different department. And so it could be different at different places. But the one thing I want to stress and emphasize is you guys, one, always go in the front door. Don't ever try to just sneak around the side, throw up a drone and fly. There's, there's so many concerns with that. Um, always let people know that you're there, what your intentions are. I mean, obviously if it's your campus, um, I, I've become really close with the people in our risk management. They know mm -hmm. who I am, they trust me, and because of those relationships that I've built, they actually fight for me to be able to do certain things. Um, but I strongly recommend just making sure to follow the rules. And again, I'll say it again, always go in the front door meaning they always know who you are, what your intentions are. And the other thing to be just mindful of, when you're flying a drone, this isn't just local laws, this is federal laws. Mm -hmm. And so just, just be careful what you do. Um, and, and going back to those relationships, because they know me, because they trust me, hopefully the plan, if everything goes through, this has been like a four or five year process trying to figure this out. I've been wanting to fly during a football game. Now this is a helicopter shot, it's not a, not a drone shot. But on campus, they've been very like, no way, I like, can't do this. Uh, but they've been really fighting for me to be able to do this. And because of that, because they know me, because they trust me now, um, I've been trying to work with, it's, it's strange, you have to do TSA and FAA and the process actually is the same approvals that you have to get to fl do a flyover, like with jets, is the same process you have to go through as a drone pilot to get permission to fly during any kind of you know, professional um, or college level athletic event. And, and there's certain rules that are associated with it. But yeah. um, anyway, so relationships are huge. If you're going to be the only drone pilot or one of the drone pilots on campus, make sure that they know who you are and follow the rules so they trust you and they'll open doors for you if they can trust you. Okay, so, oh, oh. go ahead. So, Donovan, you're a student and you're working yes. for the communications office? Yeah, I work for so the So when you fly a drone, do you have the same lack of liability that a full-time employee has? How that's a great question. What, what, do you, what do you mean by that? So, Are you talking uh, like through I, I know we have some student photographers and they fly drones and no one's enforcing anything on our campus. Mm -hmm. And some of them say I'm insured, some of them say I'm not insured. 
Um, but I'm just wondering if you were asked by the communications department to fly a drone on campus, then the college becomes responsible. But if you're, it, I'm just wondering how it works. If it yeah, great question. So, so if Donovan as a student is flying on campus under the direction of our university communications, how is he, is he still covered through all that? Right. And, and I would say yes, he is, because as an employee, he is flying. And that's one of the important things, too, that I learned through communicating with our risk management. And they were saying, even if you're not flying on campus, still work through us, because if you go off-site or if you're traveling and you still you know, fill out a form or let us know, you're covered under insurance, even if you're not on campus. And so that was, that was something I'm like, oh, I didn't even realize that because I go off campus. I'm like, oh, I'm not on campus. I don't have to worry about you guys anymore. I'll just go fly. <laughs> but the reality is if something happened out there and we needed insurance, it's best to let them know because then we're covered under that. And it's a lot easier to prove that. Or... So, yeah, he would be covered. So if you're not going to start by just flying a drone on campus, maybe you want to kind of get a feel for just what the drones are like and you want to fly recreationally, maybe near your house or you go on a trip and you kind of want to fly. Uh, we felt it was important to mention that there are drone rules that you have to follow regardless of whether or not you're commercially flying or recreationally flying. And these are not all of the rules. These, these are, are just, not all. These are just ones that we thought were important to, to make sure to point out. Yeah. So to get started, you can't just fly anywhere. Um, kind of going back to earlier, there are different levels of airspace depending on how close you are to an airport, how big that airport is. Um, so being mindful of that so when for you fly. For example, right here important. on campus, I looked this morning and we are in Class C airspace for one of the local airports. And so you actually have to get approval through, and there's, there's apps that do this too that are, mm -hmm. you can apply for or communicate with them, it's called the Lance approval, and you just fill out your flight and they'll automatically say yes or no. Um, but you have to get permission from that tower to fly in certain airspaces. So mm -hmm. if you're, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that you can't see, like you don't see like, oh yeah, we'll look outside, yeah, we're in classy airspace. Like we have no idea, <laughs> right? I, have no, I had no idea there was an airport this close. And so it's just really important to be aware of your shine. You can't just throw up a drone anywhere. Yep. And with that, if you do find a place that you can toss your drone up and fly, you have to stay below 400 feet above ground level. Um, anything above that, you're going to need that approval to fly in that airspace. Um, but if you stay under 400 feet, you should be good. Um, you can't fly over people. That's a huge uh, issue with uh, drone pilots. And there's a lot of liability that you have to be able to be aware of doing that. So best just to kind of avoid it unless the people you're flying over are with you and they're aware that they're, you're they're, flying over them. And they're, they're directly involved with what you're doing. Yeah. Now, you can't, you can't broadcast to a large crowd and be like, hey, guys, I'm flying a drone. If there's <laughs> anybody that doesn't want to be in like the drone flyover, step out. You, you still you can't, can't do, do that. that. <laughs> yeah. So I know we see a lot of drone videos of people flying over people or drones flying over people, not people flying over people. That'd be a little crazy. That'd be weird. You guys know what I'm saying. And the reality is there's certain classes of drones that you are allowed to do that. Now, there's yeah. recent laws that passed that, and, and there's a lot of different variables with what those classes of drones are. But overall, you can't fly over people. But the class photo, that's not flying over them, it's flying No. <laughs> so Yeah, so you can't be directly over them. Yeah, because yeah. if the drone falls out and hits somebody, that's kind of what their main concern Even is. with a commercial Yep. License? Yeah, there's still regulations you have to go through with a commercial license. To you fly you can apply for waivers through the FAA for different circumstances, yeah. right? And then, again, there are certain classes of drones that are under a certain weight. There's prop guards. Mm -hmm. um, there's, you know, all sorts of things where it's like, okay, I can fly over people under these circumstances. Yeah. Um, I have a question on that. So go ahead. It kind of sounds on some level common sense would, would be considered flying over people. Yes. That opening shot you had, which was as a selfie stick, I guess technically you're over a person who might be yourself. Yes. So. Mm -hmm. But I'm directly involved with it. Yeah. Okay. And, I, and I'm the, the remote pilot in command of it, you know, so I that would be okay. That helicopter shot that you showed, if you were emulating that, you, I mean, technically there could be a person underneath that you probably don't have no clue about. You're over a commercial street or yep. whatever, even though you're not right over the stadium. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, so you got to just be really careful. Those are all very good points to be aware of. And just 
being completely aware of your surroundings, where you're flying, what you're flying over, just to be, just to be safe. Yeah. Another common sense one, you can't spy on people. Um, no matter how nosy your neighbor might be and how much dirt you might want to get on them, can't do that. That's not cool. Um, you have to register your drone with FAA if it's over um, 0.55 pounds. That's where the minis, uh, the DJI Mini 3 Pro or the Mini 3 come in clutch is that they stay under that weight limit with the battery. So you don't have to register. But registering your drone is super easy. It's like $5. It lasts three years. Um, and then and it's like gotta, a five-minute process. Yeah. And then you just got to put the registration number on the outside of your drone. Super easy. Um, you have to stay away from airports. Another common sense one. Just can't get in the way of airplanes or helicopters, right? You got to yield the right of way. Um, you also have to keep your drone within the visual line of sight. So you can't use binoculars to see your drone. You can't use a telescope. Um, you have to be able to visually see with your eyes your drone at all times. So yeah, you can't just pop it up and just go fly. Yeah, anywhere. you can't just like fly behind a tree and not be able to see it. Um, you can't fly in a national park. Uh, funny story, I did that once uh, without knowing that that was super illegal. Um, I found out afterwards that if I had been caught, I could have been arrested and put in jail for six months and faced a $5,000 fine. So yeah, the, the FAA really takes this stuff seriously. Uh, I wasn't near an airport. I wasn't anywhere around any airspace that, at least on the map that I looked at, identified that I needed permission. Uh, but just stuff like that, you kind of want to be aware of wherever you're going to fly. But this is a park, right? So it's not like a wildlife management area. No. Like, it you know, yeah. So just kind of be careful where you fly and look at the which, regulations. Which brings up. Yeah. Yeah, they do. Yeah. And, yeah, and they with, will. And with sporting events too, like professional sporting events. Yep. Yeah. So. so we, oh, go ahead. In line with the national parks, we work a lot with national um, uh, forest service land. Yeah. National forest, but not park. And I know that we have to get a permit. Have y'all mm -hmm. done any of that process? And do you know what that process For, is for like? that, I have not. Okay. But I assume the process, like there is a drone FAA site. And through that site is where you apply for different waivers. And I assume for flying in a national park would be the same process. Yeah. And you, I mean, it, they're pretty easy to fill out. So for example, there's even a spot on campus that I mentioned before where because we have a, a hospital and a helipad really close, there's, it's a no-fly zone. Yeah. So there's like a grid system. And in that grid system within the airport airspace, it'll give you a number. So zero means zero feet. 200 means you can fly up to 200 feet in this grid. 400 feet here. So there's a big chunk of our campus that's in the zero grid. But I've applied for a waiver that I can fly through that. So, and it's for, you know, and I specify the length that I want the waiver for. Mm -hmm. um, and so I kind of have a blanket waiver. So I just call the life flight at the hospital. I coordinate with them and the tower at the airport just to let them know I'm flying. They have my number if they're coming in. So they, I know I need to get out of the way. So that would be the portal for Yep. Yeah. For yep. the most part. And they're they're relatively easy to fill out. Yeah. Um, you can't fly your drone at a sporting event. Uh, that's a big one as well. You should know. That's why Nate said it's been a four or five year process. Uh, the actual rule within that is you can't fly an hour before the event. You can't fly any time during the event. You can't fly an hour after the event within a three mile radius of that stadium. And yeah. That, that's like. Um, any professional stadium or if it, you have a college that the stadium seats more than 30,000 yeah. people. If it's under that, there's, there's no regulation on it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so just, it's mainly kind of applies to your football stadium if you have one. So, so like NCAA rules, no drones over stadium. Like we run into that a lot where like we've had refs, we had a couple of flies drone adjacent to the stadium. How do you manage well, that's a great question. We haven't yet. Okay. Yeah, we're going but to figure that out in the that, summer. That's, hopefully, that's the process that I've been going through. Okay. So hopefully, this football yeah. season, all of those ducks will yeah. be in so line. We're not happy, but like we're under the allotment of people. And so, yeah, that's a great question. I didn't even think about or or recognize are there specific NCAA rules with regards to drones, and my honest thoughts are I don't know. Maybe we'll cut this out of the video, but uh. <laughs> The NCAA has no authority in airspace. Okay. Like, gotcha. they have no authority. So, I don't know. Okay. 
I don't know, but those are just my initial thoughts. Yeah, I mean, that was our response when they came to me and were complaining. I was like, it's not a field you have yeah. authority. Yeah. The cops back. All right. So, yeah. so we're, we're out of time. We're happy to stay a little bit and answer questions. I know we have other sessions to go through. Thank you guys so much. Hopefully it was helpful. Um, any questions? How do you keep a drone in a line of sight when it's so high up? So, great question. There's a couple of things you can do. One, it's pretty easy to see if you're not, so one of the problems we have is we have the mountain background yeah. and it can get lost in the texture of the mountain. So one thing that I do is I put a strobe light on it and so that helps me to be able to see it. Yes. But I mean, if it's up against the sky, unless you're looking right into the sun, I can, I can fly pretty much from one end of campus to the other and still see it. Even while you're watching the monitor? So you can also have somebody that helps you to watch the drone as well. <laughs> but you're watching the monitor and you just have to be able to look up and, and see it. Yeah, and you're allowed time to kind of search for it a little bit too. So if you look up and can't immediately find it, you can kind of take a second to figure out where it is. Any other questions? You want to hit on remote ID? Yeah, so there are current laws being passed that your drone has to broadcast its serial number. For the most part, you don't have to worry about that if you're buying a drone on the market right now that's pretty new and uh, up to date. That broadcast is kind of already there for you. So you don't have to worry about that too much. If you own an older drone, um, you may have to have something with you to broadcast that. Um, we, can, we can touch on that a little bit more. But if you're buying a pretty current drone, like any of the ones we showed on the presentation or either, even some other options that are within the last few years, you should be fine. It's just a way to kind of help keep everybody organized in the air so every, yeah. people know where everything is. Yeah. So the question, you, you basically covered all sort of like written stuff, you know, online. In terms of actually the, the learning how to fly this and not like running yep. into the walls and stuff like that, how do you, how do, you do that to people? You just do it. There are there are people that will. Yeah, so you can find people that have your current drone, like the same drone that you have, and you can. Some people will hire that out. Some people will just go and fly with you. I've done that with people. I've just gone out with them their first time flying and just been like, hey, here, are generally some controls, uh, and you, I always take them out their first time to just a really open area where there's like not a lot of trees. There's not. We're not close to an airport, right? There's, there's like minimal obstacles in the air so that like if, if something happens or they're still trying to get used to how fast it moves or you know, how far it goes up and down, you know, they're okay. You, you, you've got your controls here and then, I mean, what's front and left and right in terms of where the drone is, you don't kind of, I kind of know, I guess, on some yeah. level or unless you're looking at a screen or a yeah. camera screen. Yep. And so, yeah, I mean, you can use the drone to look around to get your bearings while you're in the air and see that way. And honestly, they're a lot easier to fly than not. I mean, if you let go of the controls because you panic, it's just going to hover there. Yeah. So do that's. Do you use the automatic return or do you try to do it by manually to get it back? I fly manually back most of the time. Uh, and that's just me keeping an eye on my battery level so that it doesn't like hit, say, like, hey, you're at like 3% and you're like 500 feet away and I'm not going to make it. There's not a lot of time on these. No, so it, you, it depends like, on the drone. Mm -hmm. You can have anywhere from six minutes to forty plus minutes. Yeah, well, that's not bad. depending on the drone. No, so most of the drones we showed up there, well, you'll you can fly about uh, thirty minutes on a battery. Yeah. Also, the weather affects it. If it's yeah. Really yes. <laughs> yeah, weather does really affect your cold. battery. Our battery dies so fast. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Cold too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's All a right. lot of things that can affect your drone battery, but just keeping an eye on that. Um, if you are certain ways out. Um, your drone is set up so that it's like, hey, you're at like 20%. We're going to start coming back to where you took off from unless you tell me otherwise. And so if something really starts to happen, the return to home feature can kick in and just kind of bring your drone back. So. All right. Yeah. We are past time. But if you guys have any other questions, feel free to come up to us and we'll try to answer any questions you have. But thank you guys so yeah. much. Yeah. Appreciate it.